With a new album to promote, Pink Floyd set out on a long tour all over the world. We made a record, we thought, touring, yes, sounds like fun. It's actually a very long time since we've done any proper touring because the wall was such a sort of static show, it was untourable. The shows from August 1988 at the Nassau Coliseum in New York were released as a live album and concert film. I already mentioned in my momentary lapse of reason review that I prefer these live renditions to the album cuts. Seriously, these are a lot better. It helps that both Nick Mason and Richard Wright are back in their respected musical chairs considering they weren't as heavily featured on the studio disc. But this is also the first time they incorporated a kind of greatest hits type set. Even when they do Momentary Lapse of Reason, they don't do the same track order. So they do some songs from Dark Side of the Moon, Wish You Were Here, and even a couple from The Wall. We sort of had a vague priority on having things that uh, myself or Rick or Nick had writing credits on. I did a whole interview with Machan, Durga, and Scott, and man, did they tell me some incredible stories about this tour. All the rock and roll cliches that you've ever heard about, we did all of yeah, them. Nice. So David Gilmore, Nick Mason, and Rick Wright, still technically a salaried performer, were the core band. John Karen and Scott Page, who performed on the record, joined them as well. I get the call and it's Dave on the phone. He says, we're going out. Would you come and join the band? We're going to do this tour and everything. And I said, let me, let me think about it, Dave. So I, I, I didn't know for sure if I wanted to do it because he was talking about going out for a year or two. So I remember going to uh, Tower Records that night and bought a bunch of records. It was like two o'clock in the morning. I came back, got the records, yeah. and everybody was saying to do it. So I called Dave back and I said, yeah, okay, I'll do it. Let me put it this way. It was, I'm so thankful I did that job. <laughs> That job changed my life dramatically, and I think all of ours, no question, you know. It's just been an incredible yeah. ride, so I'm very thankful. On percussion, we got Gary Wallace, who is just so entertaining to watch, jumping up to hit cymbals. You can do things with two drummers and have one playing the time, the other playing the fills and so on. On guitar, Cambridge friend Tim Renwick joined the party, who I mentioned before had played with Roger Waters. On backing vocals was Machan Taylor, who had just come off of working with Pat Benatar. Buford Jones, who was the front of house mix engineer for Patty, ended up doing Floyd. So he mm. recommended me for the job and they were just mixing momentary lapse of reason. I went down there and at the end of a very casual conversation, he just said, well, so do you want to go on the road? <laughs> and that, that was like it. Joining the band later in the tour was Durga McBroom, whose sister Lorelai would fill in for Machan for their 89 dates. David said he wanted to add some color. I happened to be in New York because Lorelai was recording her album with Nile Rodgers and she had had me come out to sing backing vocals with her. We sent in photographs, this is how old this is, I'm surprised we didn't use a carrier pigeon, but we sent in, <laughs> uh, we mailed in photos and, and cassette tapes of some of the stuff we'd been recording with Nile, and David, I guess, wanted someone to sing bottom, and you know, that's where I live. And completing the trio of backup singers was Rachel Fury. Okay. Whatever happened to Rachel? Yeah. I was well, whatever funny. happened to her? Nobody um, knows. That is the strangest thing. Everyone I've ever else. Asked. My, my understanding is that she um, left the music business to pursue animal rights activism. I, I saw a YouTube video. Somebody timestamped uh, money and then they timestamped Rachel's kiss where she just blows a kiss to Dave. I know, <laughs> people think that she and David were having a thing. They weren't. Let me they weren't. put that to rest right now. There's nothing we Rachel knew about. Rachel and David <laughs> never had a thing. But who would take Roger Waters' place on bass? Well, Tony Levin, who played on the album, was already committed to play with Peter Gabriel. So the band turned to Guy Pratt, who I mentioned before had worked with David on Brian Ferry's record. According to his book, he didn't even have to audition as a bass player. David just needed to hear him sing Run Like Hell. And from this point on, he would pretty much remain Pink Floyd's permanent bassist. Pink Floyd and crew took over an entire airplane hangar in Toronto to get themselves ready for their much anticipated tour. Those were interesting Rachel, rehearsals, too, weren't they? Mm -hmm. oh, oh, oh. oh, yes. I remember when Bob yes. Ezrin came yes. in, was a little loose for this giant tour that was going on, like way loose. And then, like, I think it was 10 days or 12 days when Bob came in, man, it was like, okay, you're over here, you're here, you play here, don't do this. Da, da, da. He just basically, you know, 
really whipped it into shape. Apparently Nick and Rick both felt out of practice at the start of the tour, leaning on Gary and John to handle most of the percussion and keyboard parts. But as the shows went on, they both found their confidence and the whole band became really tight. Just being reminded of actually touring and playing live could be fun. Even though David is essentially now the dominant frontman, it does feel more like a band environment where every band member gets a chance to shine. Interesting enough, they started their first few shows with Echoes, but shortly after they replaced it with Shine On You Crazy Diamond. And this would remain their opener throughout the tour and most of the 90s shows as well. The first time I heard David Gilmour singing it, it was different. He approaches the melody much different than Roger, but nonetheless a great performance. Scott also does a great job filling in for Dick Perry, who had left the business by this time. Gilmore really changed my entire thinking about music. He's the master of melody. And so I started thinking more melodic and just trying to play things that people like a singer more or less than try to play a lot of notes. Also, Scott is just so much fun to watch on stage. There's been lots of comments about his amazing 80s mullet and his bent leg stance. And immediately following Shine On is when they showcase the new album. A lot of new videos projected on their famous circular screen, an actual rower for Signs of Life, and it's learning to fly where the performance is taken to a new level. It's great to hear Nick back on the drums, with Gary adding in those unique percussion flourishes. Guy comes in with that bass, and we get a solid groove going. Guy discussed his role in his Lockdown Licks videos. It's one of those things where just playing it live gave it that extra sort of 10%, didn't it? And David's vocal is much better than the record. He sounds more confident, like the kind of pilot you want flying you through this journey, and that's just what he's doing throughout this concert. But the lead guitar parts are actually played by Tim Renwick. He sounds great. His playing is very different from Dave's, so it sprinkles in some unique flavor for the song. And this was about the only song that um, the, the press was still allowed, photographers were still allowed in for. So in all the reviews the next day, there would just be a picture of Tim, which is brilliant. The rest of the concert continues with good versions of yet another movie, Terminal Frost, Sorrow, which rather than just fading out anticlimactically, actually returns to that opening guitar line. <laughs> And I also love that Rick's voice is more pronounced here. Dogs of War, augmented by fire blasting out of the stage, features Dave and Scott trading licks. It's one of my favorite ones to do with Bachan. We got the hit going, girls. <laughs> There's dancing on that one. But the essential track for me is this performance of On the Turning Away. I know I highlighted it from the studio album, but this is the version. The dynamics have more movement to them. Rick and John have an ambient keyboard opening before Dave starts singing. During the last verse, there's a choral breakdown featuring everyone singing, and this is just gorgeous to listen to. It's like they're all just pleading to the audience that there'll be no more turning away. And then Dave starts his solo and... Well, what can I say? It's another classic David Gilmour guitar solo. Honestly, I'd put this live version of On the Turning Way up there with some of their best classics. Also, Machan, that scream you do during the solo is just perfect. One Slip was actually performed as an encore, and once again, I prefer this version. The energy is infectious, especially when Guy lays down that bass solo. Tony Levin actually played on a Chapman stick uh, on the album. I basically turn all my effects on and hope for the best, because I'm actually trying to copy a Chapman stick, which of course you can't do. It's so good. Tony Levin's Chapman stick is unique, but Guy's bass just packs so much punch and makes one slip another classic. 
But what about the rest of the songs from the second set? Well, we got one of these days with Guy, of course, standing in for Roger, and it also featured a new version of the pig. Part of the legal proceedings prevented the band from using the pig from the Animals tour, so to get around this, they made a flying pig with a set of testicles. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, he had big, he had a big oh set of balls. Yeah. I actually have had <laughs> testicles Humongous. and penis. In fact, they used to keep the pig in a big bin in preparation for its inflation. Yep. But unfortunately it rained. So that bin had water in it. So when it inflated and rose up, water, all the water that had gotten inside the pig went to the lowest point. And as you can imagine, <laughs> um, that was the tip of the penis. So <laughs> they had to send it out over the audience and they, it was hanging too low. So they had to snip the end off so they send the pig out and it's pissing all over the audience. We were dying. You remember that? It oh, was God. hilarious. This is the greatest story of all time. But from Dark Side, they perform Time. And again, having Dave and Rick sing together again is such a treat. They play Money, Us and Them, and even On the Run, which featured a bed flying across the venue. On Money, they have an extended reggae-style break with multiple solos. Do you remember when he added Great Gig to the set and we had to do it at Budokan the first time? I definitely yes. want to hear about that. Oh my god, that was so embarrassing. Because it's hard, but we got it. We got it in the end. Also from Wish You Were Here, they did the title track and Welcome to the Machine. From The Wall, they do another brick in The Wall, along with Comfortably Numb. I don't think they'd be able to get out of the building without playing that. How is this done without Roger, you ask? Well, Rick sang his part with John and Guy harmonizing with him. Kinda makes it a little creepier, but it works. Though I actually prefer when Rick sang it himself on David's 2006 tour. I mean, if you don't have Roger singing, Rick is the next best thing. Of course, Dave plays his iconic solo, but Give it one more tour before it reaches God level. And finally, the last encore following one slip is Run Like Hell. This was always one of my favorite Dave and Roger duets, but Guy brings his own personality to the table, which I like. There's a huge fireworks finale and the concert comes to a close. Like I said, this is a great way to experience the music for Momentary Lapse of Reason. As for the Dark Side tracks, well, Join me in the next tour. The tour was unbelievably successful, one of the highest grossing tours of the decade. And it didn't stop with Delicate Sound of Thunder. They ended up playing in Moscow for the first time. How times have changed. And a live broadcast from Venice, Italy. Yep, back to Italy again. Though there were issues involving the volume impacting the ancient architecture. Still, it's become a live staple from their history. One last show was done in Nebworth in 1990. They even headlined above Paul McCartney. And this time, Candy Dofer played sax, and Claire Torrey reunited with the band on Great Gig in the Sky. It was also the first time Sam Brown sang backups with them. They would take a much-needed break from touring, but they would reunite to fill out a soundtrack for a racing film called La Carrera Panamericana, a race in Mexico Dave, Nick, and Steve O'Rourke actually competed in. The soundtrack included material from Momentary Lapse of Reason and Delicate Sound of Thunder, including some new instrumental material, the first in almost 20 years to be credited to Dave, Rick, and Nick. Also worth noting is that many of the band members from Delicate Sound played on Durga McBroom's album with Blue Pearl, Naked. The song Alive, not to be confused with the Pearl Jam song, features a David Gilmour guitar solo and keyboards from Rick Wright. Richard was so excited. He was like, I'm going to play on a pop record. He was all really <laughs> excited. <laughs> and when he hits that opening chord on that song, it just, to this day, every time I hear it, it just warms my heart because it's just so quintessential. Mm -hmm. And there'd be plenty more music where that came from. But you know, I wonder what Roger's been up to throughout all of this. Let's check in with him next time. <laughs>